You're listening to Gospel Bound, a podcast from the Gospel Coalition for those searching for firm faith in an anxious age. I'm your host, Colin Hansen. God is in the longest lived, worst marriage in the history of the world. That line is from Tim and Kathy Keller in their short new book, On Marriage, part of the How to Find God series with Penguin Books. They continue. God is the lover and spouse of his people, but we have given him the marriage from hell. End quote. But God has been faithful even when we were not. He sealed this union with us through Jesus Christ and his cross and his resurrection. Tim and Kathy write, quote, Your marriage to him is the surest possible foundation for your marriage to anyone else. The Gospel grounds what Tim and Kathy write, not only in this new book, but also in their previous works, The Meaning of Marriage and The Meaning of Marriage, a couple's devotional. I work with many young couples preparing for marriage, and Tim and Kathy's work is the first resource I hand them. If you want to know the secret of a great marriage, then you need to understand the mystery of Christ in the church in Ephesians 5.32. Any great marriage on earth points toward that one in heaven. If you're looking for the one... You'll only find him in Jesus. The gospel saves us from expecting too much from marriage, which makes us more likely to get divorced, and from expecting too little, which makes us less likely to ever get married in the first place. Tim and Kathy, join me on Gospel Bound to discuss the link between decreasing marriage and decreasing religiosity, how to know you're ready to get married, how to raise children to prepare them for marriage, and more. Tim and Kathy, thank you for joining me on Gospel Bound. Thank you for inviting us. Tim, let's start with you. A recent report from Lyman Stone for the American Enterprise Institute sought to find reasons for declining religiosity, and one of his key findings attributed the decline to fewer and delayed marriages. Tim, how do you link your work on evangelism, which obviously a lot of people have read and are familiar with, to our post-Christian era, to your extensive writing on marriage? Well, um, in the early church, the part of the uh, offense and attractiveness, offensiveness and attractiveness of the gospel was their attitude towards sex and marriage. Uh, uh, the Roman Empire, uh, just, in the Roman Empire, uh, certainly men especially could have sex outside of marriage. It was expected. Uh, and even when they were married, they were expected to be able to have sex outside of marriage. Along comes Christianity with a sex ethic, and it was considered by plenty of people to be absolutely insane and unrealistic. And yet, uh, books like Kyle Harper's book on uh, uh, From Shame to Sin and, and Larry Hurtado's book on uh, uh, this Destroyer of the Gods show that it was also very attractive at the same time. It challenged the cultural status quo. It challenged the uh, the shame and honor culture. It cha- it. It also said that the approach to sex was really basically brutalizing. And I think it's fair for Christian apologists, actually, not to run away uh, from the, uh, the sexual revolution. The sexual revolution, the secular sexual revolution, has been weaponized to say Christianity is psychologically and socially unhealthy. And so there's no way, I think, for us to talk about the evidence of the resurrection and all those other things if we don't deal with that. And say no. Actually, the Christian approach to sexuality is 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 humanizing as opposed to dehumanizing. So, I don't think we can just run away from that. I do know plenty of people want to just say, "Let's talk about Jesus and the resurrection." Let's talk about sex because that's just so controversial. But uh, actually, you're going to be it's going to be very hard to create a plausible case for Christianity if you don't include what the Bible says about sexuality because it's there. And people are just not going to go into Christianity if you let the myths about sexuality that the culture uh, propagates propagates is uh, intact. You're going to have to undermine them, too. So as much in our evangelism as we want to start with the cross and the resurrection, we really need to start in many cases with the felt need, the situation that somebody's in. And we're talking about this right now in the context of the coronavirus. And we recently learned, these are lagging statistics, but we recently learned that the marriage rate in 2018 had reached an all-time low. And we're talking about the United States here, lower even than in the darkest days of the Great Depression. 
This is very concerning. I'm wondering, Tim, do you expect COVID-19, would that make the marriage rate decline even further due to economic distress, which is traditionally where these rates have declined, or instead in, in other ways to rise since the pandemic has trapped so many singles at home without family? I'm, I'm asking in part because I'm trying to see what kind of felt need or opportunity okay. there might be for evangelism and helping people to see their need for Christ as they experience this unprecedented well, pandemic. Well, you should be asking Brad Wilcox this question. <laughs> and, and you know Brad. I know what Brad Wilcox says well, about no, this. I, I want to know what you well, say about I'll, that. I'll start with that. Brad would say that both economic uncertainty and cultural changes, the culture says be an individual, uh, stay free. So the, the, the culture, which is expressive individualism, that says you don't want to be tied down, it makes you commitment phobic, as well as the economy, which actually has become, as it's basically more unequal, it is more difficult. Kathy and I are old enough to certainly remember when you could have a, you could have a, a job. We could have worked at the post office right after seminary without any we kind of education. Jobs at the post office. We actually got, we got, we had we got, no church affiliation and yeah. we didn't know what we were going to do. So we, we took the test and we signed up. We were going to yeah. Be mail carriers in Colin, let me just let me just tell you this. After we thought it, it, until I got a job as a pastor, we would work for the post office. The two of us got jobs. We would have made about eighteen to nineteen thousand dollars a year back when room board and tuition to Harvard University was like forty five hundred dollars a year. I mean, oh, we, wow. we could have owned a home, sent our kids to private school, had two cars, and they, they were on, on a on blue collar. Uh, Salary and so the the economic changes has put stress. So Brad would say it's both. So COVID is going to put economic stress, which I think will be even greater, and I think it'll actually make it harder for people to feel like they can get married. But you're probably right that the the loneliness that is the the result of expressive individualism, for all that emphasis on freedom, in the end you're pretty lonely. And so I would say two parts. The economy is going to make it harder for people to want to get married. One part, the loneliness is going to make people wonder about spending their entire life lonely and dying uh, alone. And uh, so, but overall, I don't think, I think COVID is actually going to weaken, weaken marriage rates probably. Kathy, next question for you. Um, you know, I, don't, I don't think it's really fair to heap guilt on singles to get married as if it's entirely in their power, though for some reason some church leaders do seem to do that. You know, obviously a man can't force a woman to say yes, and a woman can't force a man to ask. We do st still need to push back where there may be some views of marriage in younger generations that have gone askew. And one of the things that I've been doing is telling young men, especially, that they need to get married before they're ready. It's not because I want them to make a foolish decision, but it's because I don't really think there's ever a point where you can say for certain that you are ready for marriage. I'm just wondering, Kathy, I know you'll tell it to me straight. Good advice, bad advice? Oh, I think it's good advice. Um, I think previous generations didn't ask themselves that question, am I ready for marriage? Because marriage was seen as one of the things you matured into. You were seen as maturing as you entered marriage. And nobody is ever ready for marriage. Um, you can't be, no, you're not ready for next month. Who knew, I mean, at Christmas time, who knew that we were going to be where we are right now? Yeah. And the problems that are going to come up in your life are going to come and they're not going to probably be the ones that you expect. So you, the best advice is to marry someone with whom you feel you can solve problems because your life's not going to be problem free. And you'd better have somebody with you that you can solve those problems with. So if you feel like, well, no, I can't get married till I have every problem solved. Well, then tomorrow there'll be a whole new list of them. So, um, I also want to say something about the fact that people think that living together is a way to prepare themselves for being married, at least to test the waters. It's actually the opposite. It prepares you to be divorced. The statistics of people who have lived together, Tim, you have to give me the numbers because I don't remember. The statistics of people who have lived together are much higher, more, much more likely to be divorced than to stay married because 
when you're living together, you always know there's a back door that you can walk out of that nobody is got, the back door is not locked. And in marriage, the back door is locked. But if you have given yourself that mentality of I can always quit if I don't like this, if this isn't meeting my needs, then you enter marriage already, you know, having that mentality. So it, you can't test the waters by living together and you really can't be prepared fully for marriage um, at all. But you can you can make sure that you marry someone that you're happy to solve problems with because you're going to have them and you need to have somebody that you trust solving them with you. And that's probably connected then, Kathy, what you've written about this for the Gospel Coalition. You've talked about this a lot. You've helped uh, friends of mine and, and many others navigate the dynamics of being yoked with a non-Christian there. And you've talked about the problems of that. I presume that's also connected then to the need to find somebody to solve problems with, because of course, different religion, it's going to create a whole bunch of different problems and it's going to undermine a shared foundation from which to solve problems in a similar way. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's, if you think you're lonely, because you're not married, there is nothing no. to the loneliness of being married to somebody who is not a believer and not playing on the same team that you are, who has a whole different worldview about everything. That's real loneliness. Yeah. This question's for both of you, but I'll start with you, Kathy. Is there anything you did as parents now looking back that you think turned out to help your sons in their own marriages? Um, uh, yeah, there's a couple of things. I'll let Tim have a couple to say. Um, one is, uh, we did not sequester ourselves whenever we needed to apologize to one another. Uh, the boys saw us apologizing, repenting to one another and realizing that, um, when you did things wrong, that wasn't the end of the story. You didn't just walk off in a huff, but you had to fix it. You had to to solve whatever was the problem. And I think uh, that has to have been a help. I hope it was a help because um, they have all addressed issues in their own marriage with the idea that we have to solve this. We can't just walk away from it. Tim? I think that the fact that our kids never felt that there was anything, that our marriage was shaky or, I, I, I think, until kids actually even even when they're grown the idea of your parents breaking up does feel like something in your world is coming undone certainly little kids i mean it's very obvious uh children cry when their parents fight i've seen it i hear about it all the time why would they do that why would they cry when parents fight because it does feel like that that the world is coming loose and our kids had a sense, I think, that because they never worried about that, that the world was a safer place than a lot of their friends who uh, we could just see it in their in their kids. The ki uh, kids who went through divorce uh, very often, by the way, you know, we know that they're good. We know they're biblical grounds for divorce or God wouldn't allow it in the Bible, mm -hmm. but he does. Nevertheless, we do see that it really does almost always have a bad effect on kids. So I think just the fact that they never worried about our marriage was probably the biggest thing we gave them. They could have easily worried because I, at one point I actually counted it up. And of all their friends, of all three boys, there was one family that was an intact family. Everybody else was um, single parent or on the third mother, the third father, living with a mistress. That was a good friend of one of our kids. Um, there were a lot of variants, but there was only one family that was really intact. So they had reason to question. I mean, the, the, the normal, the state of normal that they right. saw was a marriage that had blown up, not a marriage that was steady. But I think they, number one, they, they went into marriage without the fears that a lot of people do go into it. And number two, one of the things all three of my sons tend to brag about is they never broke up with a girl, even before they got married. <laughs> they, they, they have a perfect record. They always said, if somebody wanted to break up with us, fine. Otherwise, we're, we're there. And um, Well, they so, follow you, dear. They are loyal to a fault. And I they mean, are. And I think they probably got that from feeling like <laughs> our parents are loyal to each other. So. Well, they got that because they yeah. imprinted on you. <laughs> um, 
it takes two to it takes two to keep a marriage together here. <laughs> the um, at the risk of making this a Brad Wilcox appreciation podcast, uh, one of the things that he talks about is divorce is contagious. Yeah, um, and that's what I think of there as well. The more you see it in your own family, the more you see it in your community, the more likely you think it's not it's acceptable. Yeah, it's- and so it makes it, a big difference with yeah, your parents. It makes it thinkable. I think we, I think we all are helped. Yeah. There's certain, it, there's, as we know, if you do a sin, I'm not saying divorce is always a sin, but anyway, if you do something, a sin, right. it gets easier to do it again. So the first, the, the, there's the huge barrier is between never having done it and doing it. Once you've done it once, it is at least a hundred times the easier well, to do it again. It's no longer unthinkable. It's not unthinkable. That's right. right. And so I think when divorce becomes thinkable, then it's uh, you're too quick, I think, to go to it. And when it's sort of an unthinkable thing, it probably means that you stay willing to solve problems and deal with things longer than you would otherwise. It's one reason why I push back strongly on the statistic that 50 percent of of marriages end in divorce. First of all, that's talking about marriages. It's not talking about people who get divorced, i.e. if you get divorced once, you are far more likely to get divorced twice or three times. So it's not, it, yes, it, it might be marriages, but it's not people who are married who get divorced half the time. Right. And then on top of that, of course, when you when you account for not only Christianity, but especially when you account for church attendance, those rates decline a lot. And I think we actually discourage a lot of Christians thinking, why would I get married? Yeah. I mean, it, it was a 50-50 chance that no. it might work. It's like, no, 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 no. No, it's, you almost certainly will not get divorced if you go to church. You're a practicing Christian who goes to church. You almost certainly won't yeah, get divorced. Also, it doesn't usually happen. Also, if you haven't had the child out of wedlock. I mean, there's there, there's yes. all these factors. Say, if you have a child before you get married, if you get married before you finish high school, high school if you uh, don't go to church, then, then your chance of divorce skyrockets. So it's not fair to say the, that most people have a 50-50 chance. You're right. Right. Uh, Kathy, um, you know, this is really an elephant in the room when it comes to marriage and some of the technological changes, but there's no doubt that the the felt lack or the, the lack of a felt need to get married is connected to to the availability of sex. Um, and that's that it leads obviously to delayed marriage and technology has facilitated that, whether that be birth control on the one side or pornography on the other. What are some things, anything that we can do to encourage marriage when we've lost some of the kind of quote unquote necessary uh, elements of marriage from the past? Uh, That's a difficult question because, as I say, in the past it was looked at as maturing to enter marriage. It was one of the things that um, you, by which you show that you were no longer a child, that you were ready to move out on your own. And that's not uh, that benchmark anymore. I guess one thing I'm glad for with um, the Me Too movement, there's some things about it uh, that I'm not glad for, but it has really reduced people's willingness to just indulge in hooking up and casual sex because it's turned into yeah. a minefield and you could step on a, right. a mine at any moment. I think that at least the Me Too movement has given people a healthy fear of casual sex and that, that can backfire on you in unseen ways. And, you know, when you're being up for some uh, business or political situation. I'm not sure that that's going to lead to marriage. It may lead to less casual sexuality, but I don't know that it will lead to marriage. Um, I think bringing people into the church and giving them a vision of what marriage can be beyond just a transactional relationship, a friends with benefits type of relationship that it actually is, has much deeper spiritual roots than that. Um, that is the only antidote that I can even imagine leading to more marriage because otherwise everything else is um, negotiable. Hey, could I add something? Yeah, go um, for it. This is one of those places, though, where expressive individualism, the idea that uh, I need to stay completely independent, uh, I've got to be, uh, I, I, I have to avoid commitments. Uh, I've got to keep my options open. I've got to be free. 
in the in the short run, and I, but I mean by short run, I mean in the first fifty or sixty years after that <laughs> becomes ascendant in a in a culture, it's going to lead to more sex, because what you're going to say is we're just you know we don't need yeah. to be married, right? But now I think it's going to lead to less, because people are going to say the real problem is that people get emotionally involved when you have sex. <laughs> And when you have sex, things could go wrong. And the Me Too movement showing that, and and people start to you know start to say, you, uh, you know, you you owe me something because I opened myself to you. Uh, there was an article in the New York Times, which I in our in our devotional book, uh, the uh, you know meaning of marriage devotional, as well as I think in the marriage little marriage book we just did. There's an article in the New York Times called um, I looked it up here. He asked permission to touch, but not to ghost. Uh, mm, Courtney Sender, yeah. September 7th, yeah. 2018, where she basically yeah. was completely, she and her roommates all say, hey, you know, you shouldn't get emotionally involved. But the fact is that this this one guy who she had, she found through uh, Tinder and had sex with, and afterwards she felt the fact that he just did not answer any of her texts just felt wrong, just wrong. And I, I think what's going to happen is more and more guys especially are going to say, you know, this having sex without wanting any any ties that's just not working anymore so i actually think it's going to make people lonely and that's the reason why christianity can come along and say se the secular approach doesn't work a lot of the things that it says it's going to give you more of it ends up giving you less one of them is sexual fulfillment well secularism is going to give you less of that christianity is going to give you more of that and that's an apologetic point well, I think we can also apply Lewis's oft-cited mud pies to pornography and sex because I, I think I was thinking, Kathy, about what you said about the Me Too movement and the casual sex. And I think what it's helped us to see is that there is no such thing as casual right. sex. But like you said, it's not necessarily going to lead to marriage. It's probably just pushing people toward pornography more. Um, but the problem is then pornography also doesn't work, doesn't work long term. The studies show you have to escalate it in ways that are increasingly degrading um, and distorting, um, not only to the soul, but otherwise. And then you also get to a point where you can't really transition it into marriage, not only because of your expectations, um, both male and female here of use of pornography, your expectations are off. And then especially also for men, biologically, your ability to, you know, to to actually, you know, be involved with sex is hindered by the pornography there. And so it just, it seems to be a, a classic example where Lewis talks about our exposure to, you know, these, these things that make us think that they're the real thing, but it's just actually, it's, it's, it's just playing around in the mud when God calls us to something that's so much beautiful, so much more beautiful and great. Yeah. He, he the whole quote is he, uh, we're like children playing with mud pies right. when we've been invited to have a holiday at the seaside. Right. Right. Thank you. And that's, I think that's, that's what I want people to see. And I think that the church can hold out um, when we're talking about this wonderful thing that God created in sex and its context, proper context in marriage. So Tim, we're talking here about a transactional view of marriage. And as we've been talking about here with divorce, it's easy to see why divorce becomes appealing with time if it's transactional within that context of expressive individualism, because Inevitably, as you and your spouse get older and become more known to you, you become less attractive in many ways physically, but then also just the those pet peeves begin to build. But Christianity suggests a much more hopeful alternative. And actually, and you, I've seen you guys talk about this, and it's been so encouraging to me in so many ways over the years. Tell us, Tim, how does marriage improve with age? It should expand your understanding of beauty. Um, there's no doubt that if you see beauty as almost strictly physical, uh, you can, you can actually see, unfortunately, you can see some people who, uh, you, as you get older, one of you, you know, what one, one partner stays looking more fit. The other partner does not looks aging. And then it's not all that shocking to see that there's a divorce and next thing you know, the new partner is sort of younger and better looking, I've seen that so often. And I think that goes along with your idea that, um, that the idea that beauty is strictly uh, sex appeal, physical, uh, literal physical chemistry, 
then then I don't know how you age together. But beauty, think about this. Psalm 27 says that the one thing the psalmist wants is to go into the ta- into the tabernacle and to see the beauty of the Lord. And he's not talking about anything physical at all. Nothing physical. And then you have to say, what in the world is that about? John Owen and Jonathan Edwards both talk about the difference between knowing God is holy and loving and finding it yeah. beautiful. And uh, the, the reality is that, that when you get to know a person, there's a sacramental and, – and you actually love who they are apart from their body to a great degree. You love their character. You, you see who they are. You see their insight. You see the way they love you. And then you have all this experience that you've had with them. Uh, sex really does become a kind of sacrament because when you're having sex, you actually are remembering all that. I, I wanted to put in a plug here for the couple's devotional. I know that there's a lot of yeah. people who think that that we just snipped out bits of the meaning of marriage and then pasted them onto calendar pages. But really, um, the point of that devotional was to help you know your spouse better is to, um, well, 25% of it is stuff that Tim wrote that he's never written on before, like the Song of Solomon. But even the places where we cite a reference to the meaning of marriage, the whole devotional is meant to get you talking to one another so that your marriage deepens and that the, the pet peeves are brought out in the open and your um, your issues that you might not have even realized that you had have they, they see the light of day and you can process them together. The whole devotional, it's not meant to be the devotional, which you spend time with the Lord, but it's when you spend time with one another talking about the things that will really deepen your marriage. So, Well, that's really helpful, helpful, Kathy, because one of the things I've said to a lot of people about the meaning of marriage is that I actually think that it's better read before you're married um, because it gives you the, cause the book seems to be about telling you what marriage is. So I know a lot of people use it in, in marriage counseling or to strengthen their marriages. And that's great. Of course, I want any, anybody to read it, but really it seems it's almost like when you get into it and you read it and you think, Oh, I missed the meaning of marriage until this time. That can be a little bit discouraging when you're in it. So I recommend, um, you know, especially that singles read it. Cause I think it helps them to know you guys spend so much time in there talking about just how to identify a spouse or what you say, looking for somebody that you can solve problems with. There's so much in there, but it's helpful to differentiate that then from the devotional, oh, yeah. the devotional is especially well suited to do together in your Absolutely. As a, as a, and actually I've been sending them to my um, siblings uh, during the lockdown, because here you are with all this time together, you may as well get something out of it. And yeah. so, yeah. Um, gee, if you can get Amazon to deliver it to you, make use of your time. <laughs> well, better. you got Kindle too. We got some <laughs> digital well, options here well. as well. Uh, Kathy, and uh, this this observation comes from the this short little book on marriage. It's part of the How to Find God series. Um, you and Tim write that a good marriage can be every bit the spiritual danger that a bad marriage can be. Uh, Explain what you mean there. Well, we stole that straight out of John Newton. Um, He says that the danger of a good marriage and the better the marriage, the bigger the danger is idolatry, is that you take the other person as the ground of your happiness and not Jesus as the ground of your happiness. And I'm a full-fledged member of that um, idolatry club. When I got married, I really felt like, oh, thank you, Jesus, and see you later. Because all, you know, all the things that I had prayed for and wanted, there they were, all wrapped up in Tim. And my spiritual life took a really big dive early days, from which I think it might finally be recovering. We just had our 45th anniversary. But I mean, it's, it's seriously, um, it is a serious issue when you have a person that you love and you look to them to be the, the person that makes you happy. And the one whose happiness uh, makes the marriage really work rather than looking to Jesus as your true spouse, looking past the spouse that you love on earth and looking for Jesus as your true spouse. 
very difficult. And we, we need to remind each other about it all the time. And that's also in the couple's devotional, may I say. <laughs> oh, Tim, um, this is something I, I mean, I, I wanted you guys written these books together and I know how important you are to each other's ministries and, and just enjoyed talking with you over the years on these, on these topics. And one thing that comes from, from knowing you guys and from your writing and interviewing and just spending time together. But Tim, you write that you're, you're not particularly masculine. That's how you describe yourself. And that Kathy is not particularly feminine. But one of the things that you both write about is that marriage has, quote, it, it's diversified your wisdom portfolio. Uh, explain, Tim, what you mean by that. And because obviously these these gender dynamics of marriage are just increasingly fraught um, in a changing culture. Well, um, when I say I'm not particularly masculine, it means I, I, my, my belief is that there really is a, an essence that I don't think male and female are interchangeable. I think uh, Genesis right. 1 says that God created us in his image and then immediately says male and female. Uh, I think there's lots and lots of good exegetical basis for saying that it's together that the genders reflect the full image of God, not that either one of us is not in the image of God as individuals, but that there's somehow, it, it's there's not a, there are some unique excellencies and glories about being male, being female. So there are some things that are intrinsic to us. I also think that culture tends to accentuate, or I would say conservative culture, traditional culture, tends to add a lot of things unnecessary to accentuate it. So if a culture just says women shouldn't work outside the home, that's not, that's not what the Bible says, and you're just adding to it. I do think secular culture tries to go, uh, tries to not only minimize, but eliminate the differences. And this is one of the things that irritates secularists. Uh, there was two or three articles recently in the New York Times USA Today about the fact that when men and women are sent home together, that traditional gender roles tend to uh, assert themselves and how awful that is. Uh, and uh, so you, so there is a, there's a masculinity and a femininity about us that's still irreducible. But here's what's wonderful is, and this only happens after years and years of being together, is after years and years of being together, you in every situation, you know immediately, instantaneously, as you're about to respond, somebody says something, something happens, you know how your spouse would respond. I don't know how long that takes where you just automatically know how she would respond. It probably takes years. But at a certain point, that means in that split second, you realize you, you can say, now I could respond the way I usually do, but would it be wiser to respond the way she does? And that what that does is the increase i stay a man very much a man in fact i understand my masculinity better because i've been having to deal with a, a person of a different gender for years on the other hand i also can supplement my masculinity with her in, in her insights and at that point i could actually say you know it'd be wiser to react the way she does and i and do it that takes years and years and years and but i do think that's uh, that's a form of wisdom that comes only through long-term marriage. Yeah, if I can just jump onto that for a second. Um, I think when we, we wrote that, uh, Colin, your original um, quote that, you know, we don't feel yeah. like we were particularly um, embody the traditional understanding, or at least the Western 19, mid-19, mid-20th right. century understanding of masculinity, femininity. I wasn't frilly and played, didn't play with Barbie dolls and Tim never uh, did sports or anything like that. Um, but I think what, what we mean to say is we have um, understood the essence of masculinity and femininity to be something that's far deeper than the cultural expressions that you might have grown up with or that your culture might feel like imposing on you that they're um, there's a website called With Hands Open that a friend of mine does, and she's actually taking the image from the coronation scene in Paralandra, Lewis's second of his face trilogy, where the uh, Venus angel, the Ogyarsa of Venus and the Ogyarsa of Mars, is, would be, you know, Mars and Venus, uh, the tip, typified mm -hmm. male and female, are trying to assume shapes that would be honoring to the king and 
um, the female character uh, finally adopts a, a stance that is not with any sexual characteristics at all, but seeming to be there with hands open. And she goes, has a whole website, I really recommend it to anyone who's interested in this, with hands open that the, re the female, the essence of femininity is receptivity. And the essence of masculinity is protectiveness and protecting the, the receptivity of the um, female. And I, you know, you may not agree with it, but it's certainly thought provoking. So. Yeah, good. Well, uh, we've been talking here with Tim and Kathy Keller on their short new book on marriage, part of the How to Find God series with Penguin Books. Um, also check out Meaning of Marriage, their original work on this topic, and The Meaning of Marriage, a couple's devotional. Um, I could keep learning from you guys for a long time on this and just want to thank you for the blessing that you've been uh, to, to me and to my wife um, in our... Um, uh, 17 years coming up on marriage here. Uh, I want to end on this question. It's one of my favorite questions to be able to ask, and especially the two of you. What is the last great book you read? Go ahead, Kath. Yeah, no, you, 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 have, <laughs> nope, after you, you. have socially acceptable uh, great books. Because <laughs> I'm the fiction, I'm the one that reads fiction in the family, and Tim's the one that reads important stuff. The, the 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 less socially acceptable, the more interesting the answer, Kathy. So I'm I'm fine. Go okay, ahead. well, I am a big fan of both mystery stories and science fiction if they are well written. And um, except for the very last one, um, Lois McMaster's Boo Old series on Miles Vorkosik and the Vorkosik saga is wonderful sci-fi, very rich in characterizations. Um, I'm a big fan of Josephine Tay, Jody Taylor, um, oh golly, uh, Ngaio Marsh, uh, Ellis Peters. But what about a great book? But that book is <laughs> okay, if I have to pick one. If I pick one. Just one, your last yeah, great book. Right. You just pick but one. First thing that comes to your mind. Stretch the de definition of book if for, in order for this okay. to be. Because every reviewer says that the 20 volumes in Patrick O'Brien's the okay. novel of, of Stephen Maturin and Jack Aubrey is really just one long book divided okay. up into 20, 20 bite-sized pieces that it's really, if you put it in one volume, you couldn't carry it around. It's the size of the Encyclopedia Britannica. I, uh, Patrick O'Brien. It's the, and okay. that I would recommend that to anyone. And in fact, uh, there was, well, I won't go on about it, but it's, Takes a while to get into because it's not just written about the 18th century, but in the style of. But hang with it and you will be richly, richly rewarded. I expected I was going to hear from O'Brien or I hear about O'Brien from you. So that's good. <laughs> that's great. Tim, last great book. Yeah, you read. I think um, to me, a great book is a book that I feel really uh, uh, is uh you know, every three or four years, I read a great a book that is, I would call yeah. great because I feel like this is a keeper for, for the ages. This is something that takes has used an enormous amount of insight and skill, and I hope everybody reads it because I feel like it could actually change the game. I would say, bef I, it, Michael Horton, Michael Horton's book on justification, his two volumes on justification, uh, and before that, it was Charles Taylor, Secular Age which is about four or five yeah. years before that. They, they both, in my mind, seem to be important enough books, magisterial in their uh, grasp of a subject and their exposition of a subject. I, by the way, I emailed Michael and told him that. And uh, yeah, just because I say, you know, I actually, I don't know Charles Taylor. I, I couldn't email him. Uh, but I say, here's a guy who actually know, and I really think he's written one of the best books <laughs> I've read in the last 10 years. And so I, I wrote him and it, I, I'm, pre, I'm pretty sure it encouraged him. But uh, so I, would, I really do think I wish it was a uh, trouble with both those books, by the way, is they're actually so long that they actually can't be, you couldn't even assign them in a, in a seminary class. Because he, the, he, if, if, if any of the students said I read it during the class, they would be lying. You, ass, you <laughs> assign it the day they matriculate, and you hope that they've read it by the day they graduate. Well, I don't know. But I actually do think, uh, Colin, it's a game changer. Basically, uh, if you go back to Gerhardus Voss or Ritterboss, 
they took all that stuff about uh, the presence of the, of the kingdom, the presence of the future, the fact that when Jesus was raised from the dead, the, the kingdom is now present in our lives and we're living between in the overlap between the ages. And we're, it's, uh, we now are out there to really change the world with the power that's in the end of the time going to renew the world. Uh, they were able to handle that along with the, what Luther and Calvin said about justification and substitution and imputation. They, were, they didn't see any problems between those two things. So they didn't divide between the religious people and the justice warriors. Yeah. And so what's happened is now Mm -hmm. I do Mm -hmm. think uh, there's all kinds of folks. uh, I don't want to name name any names here that that are lifting up the presence of the kingdom and the kingdom of God is, in fact, they'll say that that is the gospel is Jesus Lord and his kingdom, his reign is here now. And we, we have his power and they pit that against the idea that I'm, I'm a sinner. I'm, clothed in the righteousness of Christ, imputed righteousness. And they say those are two different. One is individualistic and and kind of otherworldly, and one is more thisworldly. Uh, back when, you know, Ritter, Boss, Voss, and people like that had no problem keeping those together. But in the, in the evangelical world now, they are pitted against each other, too much so, so that we actually are experiencing people who just, where I'm just about evangelizing people so they go to heaven. And they kind of play down the kingdom stuff, and the other people play it up. And he, uh, Michael Horton just takes the, in a wonderful way, takes the classic Reformation doctrines of justification, lifts it up, and shows that it in no way is a problem with with the uh, the the redemptive historical approach either. It's it's remarkable, um, but I am afraid that people aren't going to read it because it's so long. Yeah, I was going to say, Tim, you're going to make me think that maybe books are a better way of carrying on theological discourse than polemical blog posts back and forth. Oh, I, I don't, I don't know. That from us? I, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I don't know. Only ten know. times a day. That's probably, <laughs> I was, I so, was actually, I was going to suggest to Michael that he, he, he actually start tweeting the entire book out. <laughs> because you can do it right in 140 or 100, what, how many, 220 characters? So he could just, he could yeah, just start tweeting really. it, you know, like well, every five minutes for the next uh, 10 years. <laughs> One of 80,078. <laughs> A thread coming. Well, it's always wonderful talking with Tim and Kathy. Check out their little new book on marriage. Also, their, it's also relatively new. It came out last year, The Meaning of Marriage, A Couple's Devotional. And uh, again, highly re- recommended. Tim and Kathy, thanks for joining me on Gospel Bound. Thank Glad you. to be with you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Gospel Bound with Colin Hansen. Join us next time as we continue the search for firm faith in an anxious age. Visit tgc.org slash gospelbound to find transcripts and past episodes. Subscribe to my newsletter and suggest a guest or topic that will help you find hope in the gospel of Jesus Christ.